All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Wu University event. I'm Dr. Stephanie Wu, and I am the founder of Wu University and your host for this evening. Thank you so much to Glaucos for supporting this event with an unrestricted educational grant. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Paul Casey. Dr. Casey graduated from the University of Miami School of Medicine, and he's an MD. And then he went on active duty with the United States Air Force. He completed his internship at David Grant Medical Center and residency at Wolford Hall Medical Center. Now he is with Nevada Eye Care, and I have the privilege of actually working with Dr. Casey significantly on many patients. Dr. Casey is a wonderful ophthalmologist. He's a wonderful surgeon. We manage many keratoconus patients together. I've seen his work. I've seen all of his cross-linking patients, all of his crazy cornea patients, and it's been such a delight to work with such an amazing surgeon. So thank you, Dr. Casey, and uh, welcome to the event. Thank you, Stephanie, for that warm welcome. I enjoy working together with you so much on our shared keratoconus patients and crazy cornea patients as you describe them. But uh, I do wanna thank you for inviting me to give this talk tonight. You know, I, I work with Stephanie and, and other local and regional optometrists caring for patients with keratoconus. And one of the most common things that I've been hearing for the last few years is wondering whether or not insurance pays for the cross-linking. I think there was a time right after collagen cross-linking first got approved that, you know, patients would get sent in and the insurance would, you know, act slowly or they'd have questions or they would, uh, you know, ask for more clinical information. They're kind of trying to avoid paying for cross-linking. Nowadays, things are better and I wanted to upgrade update your audience on what the status of is for collagen cross-linking and keratoconus patients. I have no financial interest in any of the topics discussed here tonight. So in terms of an outline, I thought given the size of the audience and the uh, types of folks that are uh, attending that it wouldn't hurt to uh, undergo a brief review of what keratoconus is and what collagen cross-linking does to help keratoconic patients. I got most of those slides. I tried to keep it very simple and basic from the uh, uh, communications that I have with referral patients. So if a person comes in, some of these patients are very educated, others don't know anything about keratoconus or cross-linking. I go through a slide set with them to ground them and have them understand what's the nature of their condition and how cross-linking works. Uh, if we're going to talk about insurance and what's billable to insurance and what may get paid or authorized to, for payment and how patients can then use their insurance benefits to, to get cross-linked, you really have to talk about the FDA trial that occurred here in the United States uh, back in, you know, that was eventually led to its approval in 2016. So we'll go over the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria and the results of the trial as well. And then you'll come to understand, you know, what it is that we do that is FDA approved, and that's what makes it billable to insurance, and what's not approved, because collagen cross-linking probably has some, some well-founded indications, but at this point, they haven't been uh, run through an FDA trial, so you can't get the insurance to pay for it. And then, uh, you know, I can, I can spend a little time showing uh, you guys what the clinical guidelines are these days. They're they're similar but different from insurance company to insurance company. So you need to have the clinical guidelines because the people come in with the insurance that they have and you need to apply their guideline. And we'll do our best to leave time for answers at the end. And Stephanie did uh, go over how to do that. And I encourage you to, to send questions in that you may have in your day-to-day -day caring for these challenging patients. So this is the, you know, that, that set that I described where we just kind of go over the basics of keratoconus. So we all understand that this is a disease of the cornea, the clear window in the front of the eye where the collagen fibers are weak and the tissue bulges forward and 
by getting misshapen that will cause blurry vision. Uh, whether it be rapid or slow, uh, this is a progressive disease. I mean, everybody's cornea starts out normal, like the one on the left. And every keratoconic has something going on like what's on the right. And they got from point A to point B uh, from when they were born until when they're in your chair. So over time, this condition does tend to worsen. Certainly patients that are younger and those that have more severe keratoconus are more likely to be progressing more rapidly. And those that are older, that have lesser disease are likely to be progressing more slowly, and that has a lot to do with whether or not uh, cross-linking is indicated. So um, the diagnosis of keratoconus has really historically been one where it wasn't that difficult to make. In fact, most of the people I think that I used to see, they just came in with a diagnosis. They were wearing rigid gasparonal contact lenses. They developed blurry vision as a kid. They probably wore glasses for a while, and eventually, one of the one of their optometrists wishes they couldn't see 2020 and uh, somebody said well why is that and then they sent him for a referral and they got a topography uh, we get a lot of patients because i perform lasik and other refractive surgeries so we'll sometimes just be screening for lasik and find a patient that way it's important nowadays to try to diagnose keratoconus as early as possible because the ideal patient is one who still has good vision, but who does have keratoconus coming along and we can actually catch them early and keep them from having and sustaining any vision loss from the keratoconus. Um, of course, you know, the topography will show thinning of the cornea and steepening of the inferior aspect as well. So here's a couple normal and abnormal scans. I find it useful to go over with patients those differences. And then we'll have also their scan and it'll look more like the one on the right if they have keratoconus. Uh, at times we sometimes will uh, also be screening for people with kind of just a, a high degree of astigmatism maybe or a family history of keratoconus and there are things that you can do there. but. Uh, you know, this uh, scan here on the right will show, um, you know, a bump on the front surface of the cornea, uh, a float or a pushing forward on the back surface of the cornea. It will show as well inferior steepening. This is an orb scan where this is the curvature map. And over here, the cornea is thin compared with the normal. So historically, I would say too, keratoconus was treated initially with glasses and really during the FDA trial for Avidra, most of the patients were in small diameter corneal rigid gas removable lenses. Now, since that time, more and more hydrates have become available for maybe patients with uh, a moderate degree of keratoconus and scleral lenses are available, those more severely afflicted. Um, of course, we as ophthalmologists would used to really come on board when they had their episode of high drops or they were no longer able to keep their contact lenses on their eye and we would perform a corneal transplant. That's a major operation fraught with complications no matter how good we are at doing um, corneal transplants. It's a surgery that really nobody wants to ever do if they could help it. So what's cross-linking? Um, this is a treatment. This is not a, a, a pill or an exercise. It's a surgical procedure. It's now FDA approved and has been since 2016 as safe and effective. And it's known to stop the progression of keratoconus. It stabilizes the cornea. And in countries where uh, cross-linking has been made to be available, it has shown to reduce the uh, incidence of corneal transplant sevenfold. And the reason that it's not stopping corneal transplants completely is there are some people who are too far gone. Their disease is too severe to successfully cross-link and they go on to get a corneal transplant anyway. And this cartoon that's shown here just shows kind of an idea that if you don't have many cross-links because you have a weak cornea and you add more linkages, the tissue becomes stronger. So this is not a, not a new treatment. 
at all. In fact, the initial basic science research was done mostly in and around Dresden and Northern Europe. And um, there were clinical trials as early as the late 1990s. And since that time, hundreds of studies have demonstrated the benefit of cross-linking and stopping progression, other various aspects of the way a post uh, cross-linked cornea is healthier than a one that hasn't been. And this slide is from a seminal paper from Mullinsack where you look at the corneas where they're either steeper or the same steepness or uh, flatter in the, um, the dark gray and the light gray and the medium gray as a function of time over the first two years since cross-linking. And notice that there is a period early on where corneas do get a little steeper and they will um, uh, gradually though, however, after that kind of first month of healing happens, they will become less and less inclined to be steeper and more and more inclined to be flatter. So what does happen in cross-linking by and large is that they get a little bit flatter and uh, they stop getting steeper. And if they stay the same, that's fine too. Um, and that would be the goal of therapy is to stabilize and stop the progression of the keratoconus so that they can continue to see in whatever status they have now. Now, how does it do that? So we have a combination of elements in a cross-linking procedure. The one element is riboflavin, also known as, or what it is, is vitamin B2. Um, it's a, a molecule that's placed uh, in solution and then placed onto the cornea to saturate the corneal tissue. We then use uh, UV light um, and a certain wavelength around 370 works well to produce a chemical reaction where free radicals are formed and essentially collagen to collagen bonds occur, usually with a with a reactive oxygen species or an oxygen atom in between the two uh, collagen molecules that were bound to one another. This leads to increased rigidity of the cornea. The cornea is stronger and it no longer, you know, gets misshapen and uh, stabilizes. So that's the, the core how the collagen cross-linking works. And again, a cartoon to that effect. So how do you do it? Well, you lay the patient down, you do it in the office, you numb the surface of the eye, you give them a little sedative so that they can relax because it takes about an hour to, to do. The um, surgeon, myself, would, would remove the surface cells from the eye in a manner exactly as done for PRK. Um, I generally use an alcohol well and loosen the epithelium with alcohol. And then you start placing drops in the eye. And the Avidro device will give you a little bell every two minutes, and you put them in every two minutes for 30 minutes. And at the end of that time, you're saturated with the riboflavin. There's no question when you remove the epithelium that if you put riboflavin into and on top of the cornea, that the cornea is going to be soaked full of riboflavin. It's a very bright green color, and you shine the light on it, fluoresces. And... Um, you do, after the 30 minutes of drops, you do another 30 minutes <clears throat> with the light. So there's your one hour treatment time. When you're all done, you put a contact lens on again, just as you would with a PRK treatment. And it takes four or five days for the epithelium to grow over. So you leave the bandaged contact lens in place for that period of time. Over the next two to three weeks, the corneal epithelium stabilizes and thickens and gets more normal. And, uh, you know, patients notice a gradual improvement in return of the vision that they had prior to surgery. We always like our um, keratoconic patients to be able to get back into their uh, contact lens as soon as possible. One of the big advantages of scleral lenses in that regard is that's the type of contact lens that patients are going to be able to return to wearing as quickly as possible because the scleral lens doesn't bear or touch or really interact very much at all with that healing epithelium. So maybe within two weeks, I think we can get people easily back into scleral lenses. They're in rigid gas permeable 
Corneal contact lenses, I like to get them at least a month or six weeks if I can, and that can be very difficult. So um, it depends on the type of contact lens that they're in, how soon that they can return to wearing them. Most patients would do one, at, one eye at a time where they would have their other eye that they could see with while they're in that recovery phase. Sometimes you get a patient who can both be done on the, on the same day. The advantage of same day treatment is that you only have to go through it once, but more often than not, we end up doing these surgeries on two separate visits. It's also difficult to lie flat on your back for two and a half hours to get both eyes done at the same time. So the FDA trial really showed that um, the K-Max, which is the best, prob probably the best singular value that indicates the severity of disease in a given patient, uh, went down in the group that got cross-linked and went up in the group that got a sham treatment. And that's shown here on the slide at right where these orange, these light orange and dark orange uh, bars show that the cornea is getting flatter, about a diopter and a half flatter, steep initial, steeper initially, but over the next you know, a year, they end up actually losing a steepness and becoming about a diopter and a half flatter. As the same group uh, that didn't get crosslinked, the sham group, their cornea actually got steeper. How come? Well, they have progressive keratoconus. Of course, their corneas are gonna get steeper. So um, this showed that collagen cross-linking, and this again was using the Avidro product, this lamp, the Dresden Protocol Epithelium off, uh, stops the progression of keratoconus in patients with progressive keratoconus. And you could, you could argue that there's some improvement too because the cornea flattens somewhat. And patients will ask and patients will almost probably assume or hope and wish that this is done to improve vision. I mean, they know LASIK exists. Heck, half of them came in to see me hoping to get LASIK. So the truth is though that cross-linking may improve vision, but more often than not, it doesn't. If you look at this topography here in, uh, on, on this slide here, you'll see that it looks as though the topography got much better. You went from a very steep inferior area to an area where it's not nearly as steep. However, um, if you were to uh, go on to look at some of the values, this, this patient's cornea has you know, instantaneous curvature values, 61, 62, 64, and then you go over here and it's like 59, 60, 61. So they still have a very abnormal cornea. And how much good does it do to improve a cornea that is very ectatic to one that's slightly less ectatic than it was before? So we don't promote or push and we strive hard to have patients understand that they shouldn't expect this to be a vision correction procedure. If they get any improvement, that's great. And if you, you'll see slides later on that show that they do improve. Their best spectacle vision improves, their uncorrected vision improves, but both of those are generally bad to begin with and they're still bad, albeit better, after the treatment. There can be other improvements that you might not you know, think of too much, like maybe it'll get a little easier to fit them with the contact lens that they're in. Maybe they'll get out of a hard lens into a hybrid lens. Maybe they'll be able to get good enough vision with a pair of plain old soft contact lenses to be able to, you know, use make that an option where it wasn't before. So anything we do to regularize the cornea is, is beneficial. We'll, we'll take the gains that we get and be happy about that. I think it's always good to at least mention intact because it's the same group of patients that are sort of eligible. I think that there's generally a pretty good meld between collagen cross-linking and intact, but they're really very different because these pieces of acrylic that we place in the cornea to change its shape and improve the vision doesn't do anything to stop the progression of keratoconus underneath. It may delay, and actually the real indication for index is to delay the need for a corneal transplant. And that's kind of similar to or along the same veins of what cross-linking can do as well. Um, but usually the way that would happen is you'd have a patient who's in a corneal RGP. The corneal RGP is bouncing on the apex of their cone 
And then you put Intex in and you make it better enough that the contact lens sort of gets back to stable and therefore you can put off the corneal transplant for a while. But without cross-linking, they're gonna to continue to progress and they're probably gonna need a corneal transplant anyway. Patients in that group were shown not to do any worse, to have the Intex put in and the Intex taken out and then the transplant than those that went to directly to transplant in the first place. So it's a pretty much a, a free ride and delaying corneal transplantation has an advantage as well. In clinical practice now, however, scleral lenses and, uh, you know, Stephanie's an expert in, in fitting and dispensing and using uh, scleral lenses for these patients. The benefit of, of uh, Intex has been largely eclipsed because you're just going to bury them underneath the lens anyway. But back in the day when we were using corneal RGPs, or for those providers that may still find comfort and uh, fit well, corneal RGPs, Intex can have a role still. So the FDA clinical trials are really uh, what not only you know, enabled us to start providing this treatment to our patients, but also is the basis for which the insurance companies now pay for it, would have been uh, set up to have inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. So an inclusion criteria in a study is that uh, you may get into the trial if you have a certain criteria. And an exclusion is if you have that, forget it, you're not getting in the trial, you can't be in it. So you need to have the exclusion criteria and not have the exclusion criteria. And then the results that they were looking at, the primary result that they were looking at is that K-max value, which is essentially the steepest axis, uh, like the SIM K that's the steepest axis on the uh, uh, topography that you're using at mostly dependent cams. So the inclusion criteria for those uh, FDA trials were an age greater than 14. Well, there is a problem right off the bat. I mean, thank God they didn't exclude people under 18, which frequently happens in clinical trials. But an age under 14 is a real problem if you happen to have keratoconus in your 11 or 12 or 13, because those are borderline emergency cases. If you, at such a young age, have keratoconus, you need to get cross-linked and you need to get cross-linked soon because by definition, you're not only progressing, you're progressing rapidly. You've had significant keratoconus formation from birth to age 11. You need to get that cornea stabilized. Similarly, you needed to actually have lost vision. You needed to have it be that you were no longer correctable to 2020. If you were correctable to 2020, they wouldn't let you in the trial until you lost that 2020 letter. Well, that's a horrible inclusion criteria for us now because theoretically, if someone's 2020, we can't cross-link them. Uh, but that's exactly who you would love to cross-link. You'd love to catch these people early and identify them and keep them from ever having any real problem from their keratoconus. We see this in people that have an inferior cone, it gets picked up maybe at a LASIK screening or something like that. The steep area is beneath the pupil. And if you cross-link them, they'll never ha have, a, have an issue. They won't need scleral lenses. They won't need specialty care. They can continue to wear their glasses. But theoretically, they would never have gotten in the trial because they didn't lose their 2020 line. You need to have a certain amount of corneal thickness, 300 microns. Um, the Avidro product has um, two different riboflavins, one which is hypotonic, it's got extra water in it, and one which is uh, isotonic, it's actually like kind of hypertonic, you can think of it. One thins the cornea and one thick thickens the cornea. So when you have patients that have a thin cornea, you want to use that hypotonic uh, type of riboflavin in order to make the cornea thicker. And that's important because the ultraviolet light will go in about 300 microns. And if the cornea isn't thicker than that, you can damage the endothelial cells and you can harm the patient rather than helping them. So a uh, corneal thickness of 300 microns at its thinnest point was an inclusion criteria as well. At least 300 microns was an inclusion criteria. And then the, the most critical kind of portion of the inclusion criteria is progressive keratoconus. 
Just having keratoconus didn't get you in, you had to prove it was progressing. And there were three potential ways that you could prove that it was progressing. If their K-max went up by equal to or more than a diopter, if they took more cylinder on a manifest refraction by one diopter or more, or if their spherical equivalent went up by a half a diopter or more within 24 months, they would qualify for that particular type of keratoconus, which is a demonstrably progressive keratoconus. And um, that sort of is usually where the rubber meets the road in terms of getting an authorization. And of those three criteria, an increase in the sphere of greater than a half diopter is the most common uh, clinical finding that we have that actually gets a patient out of just plain keratoconus into clearly demonstrable progressive keratoconus. Now, of course, they have to have keratoconus, so their topography has to show with a steep cornea that's irregular and thinning and so on and so forth. And then as far as lens status, if you happen to have had cataract surgery or you're either aphakic or you have a lens that doesn't like block UV light, you can't get in, but if you're phakic or you have a UV blocking IOL, uh, you could be included. And then they felt that you really needed to be cooperative. And this can be a problem. A lot of Down syndrome patients are uh, afflicted with keratoconus. They have severe atopy and uh, they rub their eyes. And we would want to make sure that um, those patients are uh, able to cooperate so you can be accurate about putting the light on. We can generally uh, get uncooperative patients to cooperate well enough. Um, I've done a couple Downs patients successfully specifically, but, but they probably wouldn't have gotten into the study. So they didn't let pregnant women or lactating women into the study. Patients with nystagmus were excluded. If you have a significant corneal opacity, what they're basically saying is, look, at, that's not going to get clear from the cross-linking. So what you need to do is you need to do a corneal transplant on that eye. If there's a, you know, they had a prior high drop, so they got a, a big glaucoma in their cornea. Other corneal diseases, especially those in which uh, are associated with delayed epithelial healing uh, would be a problem because you are taking the epithelium off and it has to heal back over. They excluded patients with prior intacts, which is not really necessary. Those patients are usually good candidates. So these are, you see that there are some stumbling blocks where clinically there are people that have criteria that we would like to treat but maybe the FDA didn't include them in the study. There was a level of bad vision that was too bad. You were unable to get a person to at least see 2400 with the best contact lens corrected vision, you were excluded from the trial. They're saying if the eye is really shot, they didn't want to have that in the trial. Um, we mentioned the AFAKs and the non-UV blocking IOLs. Anyone who had previously been cross-linked some other way in some other country by any means was excluded from the clinical trial as well. And surgeons had the right to exclude patients if they just didn't feel comfortable uh, treating the patient with cross-linking. So what did they look at? So the FDA looked at their penicams. So they're going to look at them preoperatively and at one, three, six, and 12 months after surgery, they're primarily looking at that K-max value. That's where that data comes from. They looked at their uncorrected distance visual acuity and their corrected distance visual acuity by manifest refraction. There was a questionnaire that was in the study, and I think you'll find some of the results in that uh, portion interesting because it's not talked about very much. You may not have seen it before. And then they looked at safety measures in terms of adverse events, of which there were very, very few, and endothelial cell counts, which were stable. So in the K-max results, you're breaking out people here uh, one year after their treatment into the center column where basically their K-max stayed the same, anywhere up or down by one diopter. A stable patient was the most common outcome. And look how there's very much fewer patients who had steepening than those patients that had flattening. So this weightedness where this left-hand side part of the slide is higher 
then the right hand slide at part of the slide shows the benefit of cross linking. Now, bear in mind that untreated patients would be more likely to have their corneas getting steeper rather than flatter. But this is just looking at the group that was treated. And then if you look at it as a function of time, because that was all 12 month data, you do see an initial increase in K-max, but it's sort of like artificial, mostly from that healing response. And that by the three month, six month and 12 month, you get this improvement of about a diopter and a half of flattening. And then this is data that shows that patients see better. They see better with glasses. Whatever they had with glasses, it's usually not very good. It usually stays the same, but it's more likely to get better than it is to get worse. Of course, you have keratoconus, your vision could get worse. But certainly there's more people in the favorable group than the unfavorable group. And the same sort of thing happens when you look over time, whether you look here at the uncorrected vision or you look at their corrected vision with spectacles, it's improving over time, albeit not, not drastically. And these are all bad visions. This is a logmar scale. So these patients are not seeing well. Their average Ks were around 60 diopters. Their average uh, K max was around 60 diopters. This was a group of severe keratoconus patients. And then this is that, that, that slide that gets into the patient questionnaire. So they ask patients, you know, how much light sensitivity do you have? Are you having any difficulty driving? And they had them give that scale like from one to five. And you notice that for virtually every single score, it goes down. So these patients overall are doing better. These factors, difficulty driving, uh, difficulty reading, double vision, fluctuating vision, glare, and foreign body sensation were all statistically significant. The others didn't meet statistical significance, but they all went down. So patients by and large uh, do better as well from baseline to 12 months after surgery. And here are your endothelial cell counts, which I think show that it was uh, essentially neutral, where the majority of the patients showed no change in their endothelial cell counts. And there were some that went up or down, probably just from reading different parts of the cornea or whatever it may be. Um, certainly no trend one way or the other. So what the FDA ultimately wrote or, or labeled was that if you had a diagnosis of progressive keratoconus or if you had a diagnosis of a post-refractive ectasia, you could undergo a treatment with collagen cross-linking provided the epithelium comes off and Fotrexa is used with a viscous and hypotonic form so that you could get the thickness appropriate, that you use specifically the KXL UVA lamp and you do the drops for 30 minutes and then you ensure that the cornea is full of riboflavin and you make sure that the cornea is at least 400 microns and then you treat it at a, a low fluence, three milliwatts per centimeter squared for 30 minutes. In other words, you'd give a slow treatment, not an intense or accelerated treatment. And that that's medically necessary and FDA approved provided the patients have met the uh, criteria that we went over. So what the FDA has clearly like not approved is using a cross-linking for other diagnoses like infectious keratitis, which studies are, have shown to be potentially valuable in patients that have less than full keratoconus or a form fruce keratoconus. Uh, you can't use um, this in refractive error, like as an adjunct to LASIK in a, in, a, in a suspect cornea, just to throw a little safety on board. You have those diagnoses, those diagnoses aren't covered. And then treatments where you leave the epithelium on, where you use a riboflavin that's not Fotrexa, when you use a lamp that's not the KXL, any accelerated treatments, any LASIK plus treatment like I was describing, those are all not FDA approved. And this really brings us to a topic that I think is worth covering so that you're familiar because this term, I, I find this term off label thrown around loosely. And I think it, it's important to clarify what off label means. So what off label is, is that if you are using a device that has FDA labeling, like I just went over what labeling the 
a Vidro KXL system has, and you use it in a different situation, then that is the off-label use of that FDA approved either device or that FDA approved medication. In the case of cross-linking, it's both. There's a, there's a device, the lamp, and there's a medicine, the riboflavin. But if you are using a medication, say Peshki riboflavin, and or a, a lamp by their company or another, and you are saying that you're doing an off-label treatment, you're not because that, that medication and that uh, lamp does not have an FDA label for which you could say that you're doing an off-label treatment. But saying that it's off-label is sort of usually implies that it's okay to do. Like if I prescribe a patient an antibiotic eye drop to prevent infection, endophthalmitis after cataract surgery, believe it or not, I'm using that antibiotic off-label because there was never a study done where they saw if that worked. So um, off-label usually has a benign feel to it, but that's not what it is if doctors are doing epi on cross-linking using something other than the Avidro kind of Dresden protocol. So I thought it was worthwhile to cover that uh, material and clarify that. So yeah, insurance does pay for cross-linking. Absolutely, 95% of commercial payers now have a policy. The policy is obtainable by simply asking the payer what policy they use. These are difficult approvals to get because they have these complicated guidelines, but by and large what they approve is, the, uh, is what was approved through the FDA study, and you have to use the KXL lamp and Flotrexta only. Uh, this is inexpensive treatment. That's why it's difficult to get the approval. The company charges $3,000 for the stuff that you need to actually perform the treatment. They give us a couple hundred dollars to do the treatment. So um, we doctors are in the wrong business. We should be in the, in the medical device and medication business. But, you know, that, that it's, it, it adds up and the insurance companies are aware of it. And they tend to push back when you seek these authorizations. So you need to have your ducks in a row. You need to know what that insurance company's clinical guideline says. And then you need to make sure that the documentation that you're submitting prior to the surgery has the necessary information into it. It's important to understand, too, is if you're managing uh, your keratoconic patients with a surgeon getting cross-linking, that this CPT code is a temporary code. It may change. Um, being a temporary code, there's no global period. That means that the post-operative post visits are billable as medically necessary visits. They don't have a period of time that's incorporated into the surgery. So if you take the patient's medical insurance, you can see the patient as they're healing from their cross-linking once the, you and the surgeon have decided that you're ready to transfer the care back. If you don't take their medical insurance, what we do is we continue to see the patient for those visits and we build the insurance for, the, build the insurance for those visits because that's the way the status is now. The other thing is there's a penalty for doing both eyes at the same time, a financial penalty in that you only get paid 50% of the second eye. So that's another reason why oftentimes or an additional reason why we'll do one eye at a time. So these clinical guidelines are definitely based on the FDA approvals we went over and they use this medically necessary language in there. Um, they're generally quite similar to one another. You can try to get your documentation to be, we do try to make sure that we hit the major points, but ultimately they'll vary from payer to payer. The insurance companies would have hired experts to write these clinical guidelines and they make sure that they understand who's hiring them. So they oftentimes try to put in language that makes it kind of hard to meet their documentation guidelines. They'll come up with different things to just make it that when you submitted your package, it didn't have one thing that they required, like a, a certain visual acuity change or something like that. Um, but ultimately, there's lots of them and they're available. We have all the ones. Here's, here's Humana's keratoconus guideline. Here's Cigna. 
We got United Healthcare here. We got Kaiser's plan. We got Anthem. We got Blue Cross Blue Shield. Someone comes in with another one. We can always contact the insurance company and get them going. Don't you guys do this. If you're an optometrist out there, don't you be trying to figure out whether or not you have what you need. That, that's, that, that's difficult. And I don't even do it really, even in my practice. I have our corporate people working on these things. We have a protocol that we go through to make sure that, that we dot the I's and cross the T's and submit a, an authorization packet that's going to get approved. So if you want to help and you have a patient that you think would benefit from collagen cross-linking, a younger patient with relatively severe keratoconus or someone that you think might lose a line of best spectacle corrective visual acuity that would be bad or someone that you're not even sure but you want to get them in to be seen, uh, send them in early. And I would feel very comfortable saying, because it's true, that uh, their health insurance will cover the cost of the cross-linking if they need it. Uh, it might be a challenge. We might have to fight the insurance company a little bit, but they'll cover it. Um, I would send any and all medical records that you have, any refractions, any uh, contact lens parameters, visual acuity measurements, because you see these are all the things that these authorizations are are determined from, and it can be very useful. Like if you refracted the patient a year ago or two years ago or 18 months ago, and then we see them, we can refract them. And if we see a difference in the refraction, a half a diopter sphere, we have progressive keratoconus and we can do it. If we don't have the prior refraction, we only have one, then we got to request it and it goes back and forth. So these are patients that you send with records. And, um, of course, any keratometry values or any topographies that you might have in your office, if you have a topographer in your office that you're, uh, you know, evaluating these patients with, by all means, send them in as well. These are all helpful in demonstrating the progression of the keratoconus. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily try to hang on to these people um, and determine yourself whether they're progressing. I mean, you could. The problem is sometimes then they'll get high drops on you and they'll need a corneal transplant and you don't want to be left holding the bag where if you'd have referred the patient and then it would be sort of up to us whether we cross link them or not or up to us whether or not we can get the authorization or not. These patients also would have an option to self-pay for their procedure if they wanted to. So um, it's usually best to get these patients at least seen by an ophthalmologist so that you no longer are the only person caring for them because we're really trying to avoid corneal transplants going forward and you just don't want them to happen on your watch and your watch alone. So I don't know how I did for time, but I think that we're probably at approaching a time where we could start to take questions. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks, Dr. Casey. That was a wonderful presentation. We have lots of questions, so we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so first question is, what is the earliest corneal cross-linking should be considered for keratoconus? The youngest patient I've done was nine years old, and we tried to get that cross-linking done you know, if we could within a week, because to let it go any longer than that, I mean, there's actually an entire, if you want to do another one of these on pediatric keratoconus, there are papers out there. It's not the same thing as keratoconus. Any kid that shows up at age nine with keratoconus has almost a different disease, the way it behaves. So mm -hmm. keratoconus, usually pretty sleepy, progressing. Yeah, but kind of like glaucoma, you got some time. Pediatric keratoconus, they can progress. You can have them 20-20, doing well, seeming fine, got their contact in, they come in next time, they're 2080, 2100, best spectacle corrected, horribly worse because they obviously are having their uh, keratoconus progress much more rapidly. Uh, it's not easy with these little kids, but we can get a pediatric anesthesiologist to help us out. We can get it done. We, the, the equipment is mobile. So if we needed to go to the OR, for instance, to sedate a patient for that purpose, similarly with maybe a, a Down syndrome patient or someone who's otherwise 
uncooperative. We could block a patient with nystagmus to get their eye to stop shaking. We can get around some of these problematic criteria. But there is really, there wouldn't be an age uh, where you would say, oh, they're too young to refer for cross-linking evaluation. Great. And if somebody has corneal scarring, can you still do cross-linking? You know, a lot of patients will have a little bit, right? Especially if they wore some corneal RGPs for a while, they could have an apical scar there. I think um, from our point of view, it, it's, it's, I think it's always interesting, you know, corneal opacity and, and not counting horrible corneal opacity that you can't see through, but the type of mild, subtle anterior stromal opacity that you get in a typical, fairly advanced uh, patient, they can be cross-linked, yes. You can have a clinically, I think they use clinically significant corneal opacity, something like that. They don't want anybody getting the wrong procedure, but you don't want to make it that unless it's absolutely, completely cl clear as a bell, you can't cross-link them. Because if they're seeing well, if you can get them to see well, I'm sure you get a lot of patients that have some degree of corneal opacity, but you're having them see well with their scleral lenses, right? Well, it's the same thing. If you can get them to see well in their scleral lenses, I can stop their progression. So you use the same sort of criteria. So it's real, you're really looking at those patients that would do better uh, through corneal transplantation that you wouldn't bother cross-linking. And we don't like give it a shot before crossing. I mean, that's really what Intax was. Intax, when RGPs was the main thing, well, you give it a shot, see if you can keep them in their RGPs a little bit longer. Cross-linking nowadays is not that. Cross-linking is done on people that are doing really pretty well and seeing and have a care plan and have you giving them their lenses and they're seeing fine. They just want it to stay that way. Mm -hmm. A question from Dr. Brill. Are there any deleterious effects with all of the UV light in patients that have macular degeneration? And then there was another similar question on how does that affect cataract progression? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I, that they wouldn't be expected to based on the physiology. So what we find is that the UV light at that wavelength as it enters the eye and specifically as it enters the cornea has a, a for lack of a better term, a, a half-life, it, it, the fluence of the UV light will be reduced 50% every 100 microns as it travels into the cornea. So it doesn't penetrate deeply. In fact, even what it has about the UV lenses and being fake and everything like that doesn't really make that much sense because it's only going to go in, it's going to go a half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth. So they're looking at getting the uh, intensity of the UV light down to like one sixteenth at 400 microns. Well, then you have three and a half millimeters of, uh, of uh, aqueous where it would further get reduced. So this is not a wavelength of light that penetrates well into the depths of the eye. So we're not concerned. Basic science wouldn't argue that you'd be concerned about that. That's great. That's a, it's a question that comes up a lot. So I'm really happy you were able to answer that. Uh, next question from Dr. Rashid. Are these patients at increased risk of recurrent corneal erosions in the future due to having to abrade the cornea? Yeah, I think that uh, what I've found in my clinical practice, and I think it's, it's uh, true in other, others as well, is that, uh, you know, the, you, you do want to not have like uh, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy or something that places you at that to begin with. You'd want to think twice about it. That being said, you might have a risk benefit ratio as well, but yeah, you can get into, and I've had a couple of patients in whom uh, delayed epithelial healing has occurred. I've found it to be more common in uh, older patients and patients with more serious disease. 
And both of those are patients that oftentimes we may veer away from anyway. So what we did find is that uh, older patients, I mean, you're out there living and if you're older and you have X amount of uh, keratoconus, well, you've made it to 63 um, and you haven't had a corneal transplant yet and you are seeing fine with your contact lenses, you probably you're less likely to need cross-linking to stabilize it. You're pretty stable. You also have a lifetime of really being exposed to oxidative stresses in the cornea anyway. So we think that people who just live life, just as you get wrinkles and other signs of oxidative stress with aging, your cornea actually will kind of get cross-linked itself. Um, finally, those patients that have a really bad nipple cone Sometimes the nipple of the cone doesn't really like to re-epithelialize so well. And those areas are oftentimes very thin. And then they're at risk of endothelial damage if you can't make them thick enough. So sometimes you just have to say, you know what, you're too far gone. Your cornea is too thin at the thinnest point and you don't do that. Um, and yet, you know, sometimes it's kind of a judgment call or something that has to be discussed with the patient. But recurrent erosion is not so much more like... Um, delayed epithelial healing or a uh, persistent epithelial defect. And we're pretty familiar, you know, being ophthalmologists using amniotic membranes and prokaras and uh, patching the eye or putting it back under a bandage lens and finding ways to get that epithelium to heal. Great. And if you could advance to the last slide, and we are going to take a few more questions. Does, uh, this is from Dr. Wong, does insurance require both anterior and posterior topography to qualify for cross-linking? Um, never th thought about it too much. I think that you would have to look at the clinical guideline of that insurance company to see if they say something like that. So there's probably an insurance company out there that uses that tactic in order to get you to do it. What, it, what the FDA trial said is that they have to have clinical features on their topography of that. And they didn't say, you know, one of four or two of these and one from column C. They just, you know, mentioned all the things that you see on a topography of a keratoconic agent. Personally, I want to see... <laughs> the posterior surface of the cornea because I want to see posterior float because usually the progression is that the posterior floats forward, the cornea gets a little thin before the bump shows up, then the bump shows up and then it gets thinner still and then you get the anterior surface curvature changes. So if you got somebody for some reason who has a steep inferior cornea or something like that but they don't have a posterior abnormality change, you got to suspect whether or not that's in fact keratoconus. Yep. Uh, from Dr. Smith, do insurance companies require proof of an unsuccessful scleral or GP treatment before approving cross-linking? I haven't come across that as being a, a factor, no. And to me, it's exactly the opposite which is one of the things I would like to see is a successful RGP or a sussex, 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 successful um, a scleral lens fit or a successful eyeglass fit, whatever it is, you want to be doing well in whatever you're doing in order to really think that you would do that. So it's, it's a little bit backward. It's not an either or. That would imply that if you had a, a successful fit or an unsuccessful fit, that if you succeeded, they're fine. And if it's unsuccessful, they're not fine. And therefore, they need um, collagen crossing. That's not the way it works. So, so unless I didn't understand the, the question properly, I, I wouldn't see why that would be the case. Or if there was anything that way, it would be the other way around. Mm -hmm. Another question from Dr. Brill, do you do corneal cross-linking and intacts? I saw a presentation from another corneal specialist 
that showed that using both modalities for maximum effectiveness? Uh, I generally have been veering away from doing much intacts at all, largely because you guys are so great with scleral lenses. So if you think about it, uh, what the hell do you need an intacts in the cornea for if you're going to put a scleral lens on top of it? What's going to happen to the effect of that intact segment? How is it going to help? I mean, maybe I would ask you, Stephanie, does regularizing the surface of the cornea that's sitting in a water bath between the scleral lens and the cornea help the vision when you're trying to get them to see with their scleral lens? Well, I'll just would say from my experience with patients that have intacts, even fitting a scleral lens on some of them, they still have these very weird higher order aberrations that we just can't control because of where the intacts are positioned and how the light enters the eye. So for me, if I see an intacts patient, I always put a diagnostic scleral lens on just to see what kind of vision we'll get. Some of them are very, very successful, but I have like five of them that no matter what I do, they just simply cannot see very well, even though the rest of their eye is completely healthy. And so the only thing I can think of is that something is going on maybe with the posterior cornea or where the intacts are and all of the HOAs that are happening. So that would just be my opinion on some of the patients that I've seen with intacts. So mm -hmm. I, that's just kind of what I've seen. And I mean, you, yourself and, and other scleral lens fitters, the people who are sort of in that camp and the more severe patients yeah. generally are in that camp, they, they yeah. would just not have the intacts in there. So I've probably been taking out more than I've been putting in for the last two years. Yeah. But I, I, back I, in the day, I can tell you it was a good thing because when you had that corneal RGP bouncing on the apex of the cone and a lot of inferior edge lift and they'd come in complaining that their lenses are flexing out of the eye and they're losing their lenses over and over again and you're ready to transplant them, you could absolutely positively place intacts and get that contact to behave. And that was a, that was a valuable thing. If you have some 35 year old patient and you can maybe delay their transplant until they're 45 or 50, you know, corneal transplants don't last 40 or 50 years, but they can last 15 or 20 years. And to have one or two corneal transplants rather than three or four is a, is a big difference. Yeah. And last question, this is one that actually got emailed to me prior to this event um, from a couple different doctors kind of asking the same question is that they are noticing that the cost of the riboflavin has significantly increased and some of the insurance reimbursements to the physicians are lower than what the physician is actually paying for the riboflavin. So what is the solution, I guess, to these kind of weird situations, if any? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we get these approvals where they're like, say, yes, it's improved. It's a covered benefit. Their insurance is in effect, but it's no guarantee of payment. <laughs> so we send a Vidro $6,000 and then send out a Hail Mary. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think we usually get about $1,000 to do a to do that 0402T. So we could easily do seven cases and not get paid on one and end up doing seven cases for a net of zero. So wow. that, that's pretty, pretty, it's not good business. I'm not doing this because of the, uh, it ain't LASIK, let me put it that way. So <laughs> I think it really benefits the patient, but financially it's got some issues for sure. And yes, they could pay you less than the amount that it was and say that's what they contracted for. Or you could have a patient. What if the patient's got a deductible you know, that, 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 that is met and then they don't pay their share of the deductible that they were going to do? So that's why I turned it over to our corporate department and why so many practices nowadays have a, have a corporate partner like we have in Envision because it's, it's brutal to be in private practice yourself doing that. 
Now, on the question of intax and, and, and going back to that, there was an argument over time, but it's an old argument, where should you do intax first and then cross-linking, or should you do cross-linking first and then intax, or should you do them both at the same time? And there are papers, I have them on my computer, that argue each of those three as being the best. So I think ultimately the consensus is that if there is a person who is going to get both of those for whatever reason, and, and nowadays it's a person who doesn't have keratoconus bad enough for sclerals in my mind. They're, there's, they're, they were caught early, they were caught a LASIK consult, something like that. And th their vision isn't really right, but they can see they're probably wearing glasses. And the role of the Intax would be to improve their uncorrected visual acuity and their best spectacle corrected visual acuity, and oftentimes the quality of their visual acuity. But they're not planning to get a scleral lens to bury it all. So in that scenario, uh, I would usually cross-link them first and potentially offer them in tax if we were going to do it later. And it doesn't seem to happen that much anymore. There's not that many patients in that group. But I think that's the, the one clinical area where you still might see a role for in tax. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Casey, for such a wonderful presentation.